Hey there, you are in for a treat. If you've been like me and everyone else in the collective, you've been likely thinking, how is AI going to impact the grant writing profession? So whether you're feeling hopeful about it because it's going to eliminate some of the things that are really hard, like writer's block, or if you're feeling some fear or maybe even a combination. All of that's normal. And one of the best ways that we can start moving through the unknown is to go talk to an expert directly. So for that reason, we have brought in Philip Deng. He is the co-founder of Grantable. He's been thinking about the intersection of AI and grant writing, honestly, for two years, well before ChatGPT hit the mainstream in December of 2022, right? Like it, he has been hot on the pursuit of this, figuring out what is this going to look like? How do we actually make a tool that makes current writers' lives easier? So you are in for a treat. He's super down to earth. I can't wait to introduce you. So let's get right into it and have a fantastic fireside chat. Hope you guys brought your candle because we're calling this a fireside chat. So, got mine. I have to get the wickable candles because sometimes I forget they're burning, which I know is very dangerous. And if they're wickable, I hear them. Oh, sweet. What do you have for a candle? What's the smell? I don't think I can identify it, but it's nice. I've never done this before. So, I like having this kind of fireside chat. Yeah. Um, I've got a series of questions, but I was hoping you could take a little bit of time just real quickly to introduce yourself and we'll get into your background in a moment. But if you could just give a quick intro, we'll then jump, jump right in. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's so cool to be here. Finally, we've been talking about this for a few months now, so I've really been looking forward to it. Um, and in, this is an incredible turnout. So I'm really honored to be here. I'm Philip Dang. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Grantable. Um, my background is mostly in the nonprofit sector. So for about 15 years, um, I worked all over the world in the Marshall Islands and China um, as a frontline service provider, as a program manager. And I started a nonprofit in Seattle that I ran for five years. And then uh, I ran a grant seeking program for a big land trust and then was a freelance consultant also. Um, all of that before starting Grantable a couple of years ago. Exactly. I love that you've actually touched grant writing from all different angles, because I think that's helping with actually building out your product. So let's just jump right into the juiciest question everyone wants to know. Is AI going to take away my job as a grant writer? Can we get into that? Can definitely get into that. Um, I Increasingly, I think no. Um, I think we were all sort of um, stunned when we saw what ChatGPT could do initially back in December when you we're um, bringing our memories back there. But, you know, I think what it's going to do is certainly it's going to change the grant sector um, in a few ways. Um, one, I do think that the amount of time people spend on the actual assembling of narrative, um, character limits, all that kind of stuff, the assembly process, I think will become less intensive. It will be faster with AI. Um, I think the types of information that we can include in grants will also start to enrich. I think research is going to get um, more, more powerful and, and individuals' research capacity is going to increase. We should talk about that um, at some point today, though, because I don't think ChatGPT is uh, a good research tool yet. Um, so that's a nuance to dive into. Um, and then lastly, I think the the number of organizations that go after grants is going to increase. And that's really what I think will be the main driver that actually increases the amount of work to be done for the sector. You're saying number of organizations going after grants you anticipate will increase. Why? Because the barriers to actually putting together a proposal are lowering? Yeah, well, I mean, the barriers are one of them is sort of the technical know-how, the capacity to put that together. But I think in addition, just the world becoming more technologically connected and the sector itself really prioritizing equity. Um, I, some of the stats that I've seen are that 1% of applicants take down half of all grant funding every year. 93% um, of organizations that apply for grants do so uh, without external help. So 7% are 
um, employing external consultants or freelancers to, or firms to, to work with. So, um, and then of course, in, in the sector at large, I think 75% of organizations um, have a budget of less than $500,000 a year, I think, um, something like that, um, pretty close. And so a lot, the, the vast majority of organizations out there um, are either applying for very few grants or aren't applying at all or aren't accessing help, aren't accessing opportunities. So I think there's a lot of potential out there um, to expand the community. So what do you think from like a competitiveness perspective, however, because we we teach our members like, hey, we want to be targeting grants where you've got a 20 percent or better chance of winning. So is this, you know, I mean, that can really change that dynamic, too, of all of a sudden now funders are inundated with so many requests. Are they going to start and they don't necessarily have other in tech infrastructure in place to handle that? It's still a very human process of reviewing those grants presently. So what changes do you see to accommodate for that? Well, I do think that they're going to adopt similar technologies. Um, you know, in the job application market right now, a lot of people are using AI to write optimal uh, resumes or cover letters, and then the companies are using AI to read them. So I don't think that's an ideal scenario where you just have bots talking to bots. Um, but I think that's another role, um, a direction that I hope uh, grant professionals, the, the sector will move to be something akin to like more like real estate agents where you're actually your um, your insights the things that the ai cannot do but helping um, the right applicants find the right funders um, i think is going to be something really important increasingly important um, so i think better alignment can cut down on the number of proposals that funders are seeking in a in a way that's uh, more effective than simply just like hiding away from the world or using AI to read all your applications. Um, I think there's a big opportunity that the funders are interested in as well um, to have the right applicants find them and vice versa for the applicants to find the right funders. And so still, I think as many databases and stuff as there are out there, which I think are a starting place, um, I, I think the role of, of people here uh, in our sector, especially as Terms like um, trust-based philanthropy, relational uh, grant making are becoming much more prominent. What that generally means is that human beings should be um, in closer connection with one another, operating in more humane and, and um, relational ways. So I think that's where the work should increase. That's where I'm hearing thought leaders um, like Vu Lay has been advocating for stuff like that, community-centric fundraising. Um, those are all the principles that the sector has been trying to pursue. Um, and so at this moment, it's like, can we, how can we use this technology and this moment to yeah. guide the sector in that direction? Yeah. And one of the things that makes me think of is when we first met, you were looking at all of this, the six different phases of content that we teach in our program. And you said, we're going to plug in to this portion of phase three the writing portion. Like yeah. it is not this all encompassing taking over the research and the project management and the, all these other elements. Right. And so I thought that was just a really good reminder how you even yourself like spotted, this is where we plug in as a tool, not taking over this entire ordeal. Um, there's a yeah. good question. I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to um, weave in some that are coming from the chat, which I love this one. It's got a lot of thumbs up are what will happen when the grantors start using AI detectors to gauge authenticity? Can you talk about that? Yeah, the detectors don't work very well. Um, if you just look for a, a sampling of the news stories um, <clears throat> that are covering that subject right now, uh, obviously the place that they're being used mostly is in education. So students that are supposed to be writing um, writing on their own, uh, teachers are using the right. uh, GPT uh, checkers and it's kind of going wrong in a few directions. It's it's basically having a lot of false positives and, and missed negatives. So human written um, content is being flagged as AI written. And I mean, this makes sense, right? Because the AI is trying to create very uh, lifelike uh, writing patterns. And so you've got an AI kind of trying to trick an AI. So you have a cat and mouse game where I think you can keep making the detectors more sophisticated, but then the other models will get more sophisticated at evading them. 
So I think really it's, it's more like uh, we as a society need to come up with um, a more nuanced way of determining if we want originality as you do in a classroom setting, how do we test for that? How do we assess that? Mm -hmm. And then I've written about in my, in my newsletter that I think in the grants context, I will be advocating for authenticity um, being uh, the, the value that we prize over originality. I would say that that's already sort of happening with copying and pasting. If you use Grammarly to update your writing, you know, it'll suggest a better phrasing and you click and it just changes. That's essentially the same technology, just in a more limited context and less flexible than the GPT models. But it is still kind of, it's breaking your writing into numbers, into patterns, and then suggesting better or sort of whatever, what it thinks are more concise patterns. So um, unless you really go for an all out ban on spell check, Grammarly, all that kind of stuff, I think it'd be difficult to draw a line in, in that, in, in our space. I think it's easier to do it in a creative writing class at a college where you really are supposed to be um, growing as a student. In our situation, I think you definitely want to be 100% factual. You want the authentic voice of the client or the applicant organization to shine through, right. but does it have to be a new proposal every single time? Or do we all actually have our master documents and our boilerplate and our copying and pasting techniques? Um, so I think it's a little fuzzier in our space. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think it could be helpful just to do a really quick overview of how Grantable works for everyone that didn't have a chance to set up a free account or start using it. So can you just give like a high level overview of the functionality of Grantable just so we can, can juxtapose that against other AI tools? Yeah. So it, you when you sign up for Grantable, you upload previous writing samples, um, ideally a proposal that you've just written. Um, the more, the lengthier the proposal, the better. Um, it can always compress, it's harder to expand on things you haven't written. Um, and then uh, you can basically just uh, work in our in our workflow and have it draft proposal or responses to new prompts that you encounter. And the process is that you put in the prompt from an RFP, you give the model some uh, additional instructions like a character limit or tone specifications, the how you want them uh, the model to draft it, then the final stage before writing is to select your source material. So you can either go through your own work and highlight specific snippets and say, use this, use this, this, or there is a feature where it will search your documents semantically and pull out what it thinks are relevant to answer the prompt. And then it'll give you a draft, um, which you can edit manually as, as we all normally would. And then you can also uh, call the AI back to help you work on any segment of that output. So you can make a particular paragraph shorter or longer. You can change tense, all that kind of stuff that you've probably, anybody that's played on ChatGPT kind of has an idea of what the models do. Yeah, hundred percent. So I think this is important to clarify, like is, so Grantable is powered by ChatGPT, correct? Or no? Almost. Um, Grantable okay. is powered by GPT. Um, so GPT okay. is the large language model developed, um, the style of large language model developed by OpenAI, which is a research lab from the Bay Area, which um, probably a lot of you have heard of now. The latest model they've created is GPT-4, um, and chat GPT is, it's more of a user interface. It's a way that they created a a way for the, the public in general to interact with the language model. And they actually released it as like a, a research trial and they didn't think it was going to take off um, because it was in November, it was still powered with GPT-3 or 3.5. And GPT-3 actually came out in late 2020. So it was sitting around for quite a while and people just didn't didn't have that experience. And so the chat experience, I think, was what made the understanding uh, visible to the to the whole world. Yeah, this is helpful. So I think like one thing that people are are wondering about is is 
Okay, here comes the tough questions. You ready for it? Because my audience just has got lots of them. So if you're ready, we're going to dive in. So <clears throat> they want to know, how is Grantable better than ChatGPT for a grant writer? Okay. I'll give a little bit of context if you want, which is sometimes for, especially for, because we serve a lot of those that are freelancing and consulting. Sometimes you're dealing with like, it's the first grant to go out for an artist, let's say, or it's, they don't have this huge repository of information to call upon. And so that's where I think sometimes there's a little bit of a rub versus if you're within an organization and you have a ton of information to go dump in there. So can you just speak to maybe like that scenario, but then also just how those two little beasts compare? Yeah. The the first scenario where you're starting off with a client for the first time and you're it's really step zero. Um, I actually, I want to highlight that moment because I think it's another time where the skills of a well-trained grant professional absolutely shine. It is, that is the, mo that is maybe an even more important moment now when you have the ability of AI to uh, perpetuate whatever you're creating in that in that first go. So I would say, you know, if I were coaching um, folks in in a grant writing firm, I would say like let's use GPT uh, for scaffolding. Let's use it for ideas, but don't. Um, you should have the final say. Um, you should really be the one that is putting your stamp, your signature on the work at the end and feeling that sense of ownership and pride over the craft. From there, I think it's great to use AI even more and more, especially when there really is no new creative work that's being called for. Um, so that's how I would use either Grantable or you could use ChatGPT for that as well. Um, if you're talking about ideation or um, that, that sort of pre-writing step. Um, the way that I've explained the difference between Grantable and ChatGPT is like to, to say uh, ChatGPT is like going to a restaurant, whereas Grantable is like having a personal chef come to your home. So if you go to a restaurant and you order a dish, they're going to use the, the food that's in their kitchens, in their pantries. If you have a chef come to your house, you're saying, I'd like this dish, but here, use my food, use the ingredients I purchased. I know what's going in. And so then I know what's coming out as well. So you could get the same dish from both places, but the one that is your own, your grantable one is going to be much more personalized to you. And assuming, you know, the chef in, and you develop a relationship, it kind of, it will stay and have this growing understanding of the work with a particular client. Yeah. And I think this segues into one of the reasons people sometimes get like, we're trying to start tinkering with AI and using it and exploring what it means. So maybe someone goes into chat GPT and they use it. And then they're thinking like, wow, this writing is not me, or this is so it obviously it's excessively polite, but sometimes you're like, oh, that's like not, that's not my tone. That's not my voice. The things that make writing distinctly our own. And so obviously that's a one reason Grantable is highly useful is it starts to learn your voice but can you just talk about how different it is to learn AI than it is to learn how to use a cell phone or perhaps like a piece of software? Like it's a different beast to learn. And I think that's something that we're all struggling with because it's been a while since maybe search, maybe when Google came out would be like the last time we had to learn how to use something in a very new way. I think that is an incredibly perceptive question. And I would say that if I'm at all further on than the folks in this in this webinar, it, it's not by much. Um, I've, you know, I'm 37. I've, you know, Googled and used smartphones since, you know, roughly college days. So, you know, I have these habits ingrained as well, but I agree with you. This is a very new way of uh, sort of retraining my thinking when I'm working with an AI software. I think it's training me to be more precise. Um, there are all kinds of guides out there that uh, people are starting to write about uh, tricks for effective prompting. Um, but some of the best I think are specificity, uh, closed ended uh, tasks if possible. So you know, you give it boundaries. Um, if you can cite other examples that it can replicate, um, that's helpful. Uh, as far, but, you know, I would say the thing that I'm, I've been talking about the most is to understand 
where these models are extremely impressive and, and, and intelligent in a certain spec, respect. And then from a different angle, they're, they're very, very brittle. And I think the way to, the way I, that helps me remember how, what I'm interacting with is to understand how it's working, which is that a huge amount of training data was put into this model and it was analyzed under like an unprecedented amount of computing power and number of parameters. So hundreds and hundreds of billions of data points for all of these uh, pieces of text that are mapped together and their probabilities and linkages are all calculated in this unbelievably big equation, uh, which is why it costs uh, so much computing power to, to do these calculations. And from that, these language models are deriving the ability to, to predict what should come next in a sequence. So when you put in a prompt, it's actually generating its output based on probability. It's not looking through its training data and saying, hmm, this looks like the thing that the person wants, copy and paste. It's like, it, it, it has no concept of any of that stuff. All it knows is each next part of the sequence that is most probably supposed to come up. Mm -hmm. So if you choose something that is very easy, if you say Mary had a little lamb, it will probably write its fleece as white as snow because that phrase has appeared so much in its training data, it says, okay, it's probably this. Or a really interesting uh, illustration would be math, arithmetic. If you do four plus four, it'll probably say eight. And that's not because it's doing math, it's because the text four plus four equals eight occurs a lot just out in the wild in writing. But if you change that to two four digit numbers that are much less likely to appear in the training data at significant rates, it'll just guess that, oh, I know a number is supposed to go here and it'll spin up a completely you know incorrect answer. So I think that illustration really shows how these models are working. And if you can start to remember what's happening kind of mechanically on the back end, you can start to say, hmm, if I'm asking it to do something like change the tone, well, it's got a ton of material that it's studied where it extracts tone. So it's probably really good at that. But if you ask it to do research, which a lot of people are doing, or asking it facts about the world, some very general facts, it'll get right. But other times it'll make up entirely fictitious organizations. It, it's just doing, it's creating a, a like a prop almost, like a movie prop. And it's just supposed to look like a correct answer. So if you understand how these models are working, I think it helps you to, to start to know when can you push it and keep asking it for something better, develop your prompting, and then when should you not even really uh, ask the model for um, for its assistance, I guess? Mm -hmm, 100%. I think this is why I love your newsletter and your podcast so much. The process will definitely make sure we make that available for everyone later because mm -hmm. you're doing a very good job of explaining what's actually going on in the back end. Like I uh, you know, briefly learned how to code so I could code our website, but I never actually understood it. It still was always just felt like it was magic happening. And what's cool about what's going on here is that this actually, we can understand what's happening. Like it's, I mean, it's still a monolithic thing to get our, our arms around, but it's, um, it, once we, you're right, we understand its limitations, um, and how it fundamentally is working. And we're on the earth, we're in the early days. Like it's making sense to us now versus dropping into, I don't know, 10 years, uh, skipping the next 10 years of life and then dropping into earth. Boy, that would really suck. <laughs> That'd be too much of a culture shock. So I guess this, um, one of the next questions I'd want to tinker with would be, so we've got a, uh, someone who brought up that her husband, um, and their friend tinkers with AI prompts every day to get art and graphics, like pull, you know, using the right keywords to kind of bump their artwork to the next level. So, can you speak to just like the educational component of how we start really learning how to use AI in, in a writing uh, appropriate way? Like to your point, the specificity of close end tasks, like that all is a learned skill. So can you talk about like your plan for addressing the educational side of using your tool? Well, so 
my my partner is a, a learning and development expert. So I, I I've raised my bar in uh, assuming what I know uh, how to teach, especially. So I'm not. Um, I, I I actually my first job was a teacher, but I'm not an educator by training. Um, so my plan is to learn. I, I wrote about this in the process a while back. My basketball coach when I was a kid uh, taught us an acronym: Beef Balance eyes, elbow, follow through for how to shoot a great set shot. And we just practiced it. I've, I've, I don't know, tens of thousands of times by now. Um, and he also said, practice doesn't make perfect. It makes permanent. Um, meaning, you know, really uh, what you do is going to form your habits. And the final thing that he said um, was aim small and miss small. And so he said, imagine there was a dime balancing on the front of the rim and you want to gently brush it off with the ball when you shoot. And his point there was, if you're, if you have precision, if you aim for precision, even when you miss, you're going to miss by less. So I've actually tried to take my basketball training and adapt it to my AI practice. So I am eager to try new tools. I try to have fun when I'm doing it. So whether it's image stuff, text stuff, I go in, I, I learn about what it is. I read articles on it. I listen to podcasts about the technology. I listen to discussions. I listen to the testimony uh, last week uh, before a Senate committee where Sam Altman uh, and uh, two other panelists, um, Sam Altman's the CEO of OpenAI, um, testified before senators about AI. So I'm educating myself. I'm trying it a lot. I'm trying to have a very specific idea of why I'm doing anything uh, when I use AI in, in my work and in my life. Um, and then I'm trying to have a very balanced approach where I'm not all in on it. I, I don't think it's a panacea. And I also don't think it's, you know, a, a, it's not doomsday either. I think I'm trying to have a, a healthy balance of curiosity and uh, healthy concern just about the power that the tool represents. Um, so I think ChatGPT is a really good place to start. I mean, it's to your earlier point about learning how to interact with software in a new way. It's wild that you can talk to ChatGPT and ask it how to use it and ask it for tips on how to prompt. Um, so that's something that I think is a technique where you can actually ask the tool to help you use it better, um, which is not something that's prior been uh, a very useful thing to do. But um, yeah, you can you can write a prompt, see what happens. You could you could have an image generator open and chat GPT and you could prompt the image generator to generate something, see what's not right take your prompt, go to ChatGPT and tell ChatGPT, hey, I used this as, as an image prompt and I didn't like this. How would you make it better? And then ChatGPT will improve your prompt, which you can put back into the image generator and see what happens. So I think it's exercises like those where you're coming at it from all different angles with a kind of a childlike sense of um, like the learner's mind, the beginner's mindset. Um, yeah. I think we're all there right now. So hopefully it's not too hard for you to access that. I know I am just sort of, uh, you know, amazed and unsettled, unnerved all the time in this space. So that's, that's. Honestly, my... I love that this is your approach. I hope everyone else is like feeling, I don't know, some appreciation that Philip's not just like a diehard, can't see any other way, AI or die. You know, I just feel like because you have this healthy dose of, yeah, curiosity balanced with concern, um, it, it actually, I feel like bodes better for trusting that you're going to be using this tool really thoughtfully. And so I really appreciate that approach that you bring to it. And it's very apparent in the process podcast and newsletter. Um, also just throwing it out there, maybe we should be your education partner because we do teaching all the time. So we'll maybe team up with you and Robert and help, uh, help with the education side, huh? Yeah. I, I am not <laughs> trying to be an expert in things that I'm not an expert in. Um, Ask me about remodeling RVs and, you know, we've got a different, different story, but that's how I feel about the, like the tech specifically. I'm like, thank goodness we met you. Okay. Yeah, let's partner up. 
Let's do it. So one of the concerns that comes up often is around pri privacy of information from clients. So can you just address that in terms of like, obviously some information like plugging in an annual report is public information, but some people are concerned, particularly with complex grants that are using, you know, they had assigned an NDA to work on it. How is that information placed into Grantable and protected, if you will? Well, so the information you put into Grantable that's stored in your Grantable account, it's uh, it's a state of the art it, uh, backend called Supabase. It uses you know all the industry standard security. It's not something that's these these kinds of components are more and more um, sort of ubiquitously secure. They use the same components AWS backend that's Amazon uh, Web Services. Um, so, I mean, the biggest firms in the world are what we're built on top of as far as just holding your account data. I think what most people mean, though, when they ask about privacy is what happens with the AI model. Um, so you can read OpenAI's API policy. So the API is how other platforms communicate with the GPT language models. So according to their policy on their website, they hold the data that's sent to them for 30 days. They say they're checking for malicious content or bad actors after which they delete it. And they do not train on your data unless you opt in and want them to uh, want to participate in that in that way. Um, and then- and are you not inherently opted in? Do you have to opt out or you have to opt in? The way that they've done it is it's an opt, uh, through the API, it's an yeah. opt-in, and I I think I heard uh, Altman testify that for chat, it's an opt-out, um, but maybe I misheard him in the testimony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's super interesting, and it's linked up in the chat box, so thank you for someone for doing that. Is Grantable, Grantable going to be able to do anything with grant reviews? And Angela, you asked this question, so if it needs clarified, please do it. So let's say you have a 150 page proposal and you wanted to give you a quick gist of what it was before you dove into it. I tried using ChatGPT and it blocked it because it was 150 pages. And even with shorter proposals, because there's formatting in the PDFs, you convert it to Word and then paste it in and it kind of freaks out. So I was just trying to get summaries of ones I didn't get a chance to reach. We are working on that. Um, I'm happy to talk about where Grantable is going to, where we're headed in the, in the next phase here, but you're running into um, basically infrastructure level problems. So there is a limit of 4,000 tokens, which tokens are actually fragments of words. So that's on the language models end. If you think about how many hundreds of billions of data points there are in these in these calculations, you can see why at 4,000 tokens or word fragments, the number of points that the models are handling at that point is, is incredible. It's huge. So they have to limit the amount both in and out. So all in, it's 8,000 is the limit right now. And that will probably change as the models get better. There's more computational power that they have access to. Um, but that's a hard limit just in terms of com computation. So it's really difficult to throw in a whole document just because it exceeds the length limit. So you could section it out. Um, that's that's one thing. PDFs are just a really wild file type. So they, they, they're, they're messy. I mean, I think they can look good in the way that they're intended, but if you ever have to uh, move them into Word or anything, as we all know, they can just get really, really wonky very quickly. And that remains the same when you try to extract the, the information out of them. They're actually really pretty messy um, at the level of how they're constructed. Um, so that's something we're trying to work on. There are different uh, tools. We think we have a pretty good one in Grantable that will, if you upload a PDF, it gets it pretty cleaned up just to the text that you want. Um, but where Grantable is going is we actually are beginning to talk to a few funders out there. And we're trying to figure out um, from the other side of the problem, 
uh, in terms of review, in terms of alignment, um, all the grantors out there that do all the information sessions possible to try to educate prospective applicants to make sure that they are really in alignment and, and that this is the right opportunity. We're working with them to try to come at this from the other direction now and see how some of the same features and uh, tools that we're building can meet. So it really is like um, building the bridge from both sides. And I think when they do meet, um, we'll end up with a really, really cool experience where for the applicant, I think we're trying to go towards something where it feels like you have a representative or an expert guide from the grantor that is helping to advise you as you're working on a proposal. Um, and then for the grantor, this guide is somebody that should help um, to align their proposals much more effectively to sort of discourage or at least caution people that are really out of scope. Um, and in the end, perhaps also try to, to work on a little bit of um, uh, evaluation as well. But I think we need to proceed pretty carefully there. Uh, otherwise, you get the robots talking to robots um, scenario. All right. So this is a demo account. Um, I took real uh, grant applications and anonymized them. And then um, so basically you upload a grant application. Um, so this was a docx so that kind of lays out a bunch of information about programs and, and et cetera. And then uh, this part is just like your Google Drive. You can create a folder, so we'll call this GW demo. Um, and then when you want to create an answer or content, you create content, and then you can respond to a prompt. We're coming up with some other stuff, but um, you could copy uh, you know, a question from a, a, a grant proposal. So like, uh, please describe your programs or whatever it is. Um, and then you can say 100 word limit or whatever, um, continue. Then you have the option to search uh, manually. So you can search through all of your previous writing. Um, you could do, uh, you could search program and then uh, find wherever the, the program information is. So this is a, here's a nice organizational overview. So I could copy and all you do is highlight and press control C. And that throws this snippet in here. So that's the manual process, or you can do auto search and it will just find a bunch of stuff that it thinks are useful. Um, and then you see your input limit here. That's the tokens that I was talking about. And then we'll just see what it. This makes me want to ask about formatting because that's been an issue too. Like you try to throw in bullets and then the bolts go away. So like, is this able to add any of that like functionality we, beyond paragraph text? We're working on that. Um, the the way the feedback that we've gotten so far is that um, when people format, they generally go to Word or Google Docs where you know the the more visual adjustments can be made. Um, this can handle it. It's just that sometimes then it creates other problems. So in prioritizing what we're doing at Grantable, I only have, we only have my, my co-founder, Robert is the only engineer on our staff right now. So uh, it has to be sort of, we have to manage what we do. Uh, otherwise, if we enable a feature and it causes other things to break or more support tickets. So right now it's sort of like in a waiting pattern, but we're looking at bullet points, you know, graphs, images, all that, uh, tables, all that kind of stuff coming, coming soon. So right now, this is how it generates. Um, and then you can uh, highlight different sections and you can say um, condense or something, and it will condense that section. You can have it change the tone or, or whatever, or, um, you know, edit this manually, um, however you like, you can, you know, and do and then uh, there's a response history that will track as you're working through. So this just condensed all that, so you can replace it and cut it just about in half. 
Um, but if you decide, oh, I don't like that, then you can restore this other version. And so then basically we advise once you've workshopped it to the point where you like, um, you can either paste it into the portal directly, or you can bring it to Word or Google Docs, um, however you want to, to work uh, with, with your colleagues or with your clients. But the one thing we say is if, if the final version is in Grantable, it's best because then it has it um, for the next time you want it to answer something and it will prioritize your freshest uh, writing. Yeah, so how are you seeing people use this workflow wise? Like how quickly are they then, like they're doing the ideation. I think this is like what everyone I think needs to take away from, from this is like, this is what like helps with that messy part of like just getting text on the page in the first place working through your first, second, maybe third draft, but then, okay, now we need to go get it like in a Google doc format where we can share it with others. So like, how are you, how, how are you seeing people make that leap? Like, yes, I think so. I mean, it, it's quite a range. I mean, some people, <laughs> some people honestly just kind of use it as is they don't do a lot of shaping, but I think it's everything from just ideas to, and then doing a bunch of revision with teams um, we're, as you can see, working on bringing collaboration in and actually our next project is to work on data um, and different quantitative elements that you'd want um, to stay consistent across uh, reports or proposals. So like APIs, budgets, EINs, stuff that never, that, you know, stays the same for quite a while, these data points. Um, so we're working on bringing each part of the grant workflow into Grantable in a systematic way. Um, so that's sort of where we're headed next. That's, that's how we're seeing people use it right now is um, in this flow. It actually took a lot of iteration to get to this model. And what we realized is one of the things that we're all learning with AI right now is um, how to work with it. And so one thing we found is that these early steps in, in Grantable, at least, these are your big, big, rough changes. So if you change the prompt, it's going to change the entire output, of course. So these are sort of the most upstream changes. Then each successive phase, you're fine tuning more and more until you finally get to this place where you're actually like literally editing single words or letters. Um, and that we've found is a really important, um, we think it's sort of a principle that's emerging where you have the AI move you through the really, the course broad steps and then bring you to the fine tuning phase much more quickly than if the human were doing every single one of those phases alone. Um, but what I think gets messy is when you mash all of those phases together, like you might have in ChatGPT, where it can be difficult to adjust an upstream variable um, after the fact. So the reason we created it like this is because if you get to three and you don't like it, you know, you can take away, um, you know, some of these ingredients, you can change the prompt, you can change your direction, you can go back and forth, basically zooming in and out, and it will redo what it's doing based on your changes. So it's really about creating the controls and the fine tuning knobs for people to be able to use the AI effectively. So I'd say as simple as that looks, it took so much um, work to get to this uh, to this point. And I think we're, I think we're on the leading edge of this. I think people were going to start seeing some really, really elegant ways to work with large language models. And I think there will be some principle here about like, it's almost like a transmission, honestly, it's like low gear and high gear. There's something about that type of understanding, or I, I talk about it like a knife sharpener that I have. I love to cook. So there's like the coarse wheel, the medium wheel, and then the fine polish. I think there's something very similar um, that is possible with AI now, um, in, at least in, in the writing context where you should know which wheel it is. So do you need to make huge changes or are you trying to fine tune? It's not just a one size fits all. 
Yeah. And I don't know about the folks on the line, but I always find like the hardest part is the early part. It's like getting those big chunks down. Like that's the part that can be really tough. So one question I'm having is folks want to know about collaboration. Is that already set up? Like, should they be bringing in their client to work within there? And I could say some pros and cons to either case. Like this could be your messy work zone. Yeah. I rather only have them operate out of a Google doc where I can kind of control their attention, but I can, you know, maybe you have a tech progressive client and you want them in there. Can you talk about collaboration? Yep. So de depending on what you mean by collaboration, um, you can have multiple people come in and use your account right now. And the situation that is not yet handled is literally the simultaneous editing where like if you've ever been in a document and you see the other person deleting stuff, you know, and you're both working in, in real time together, that's actually pretty nifty code. Um, and you can imagine like when two people make a, you know, a, con a conflicting edit at the same time, how do you resolve that? It's actually sort of a, it's, well, it's not a fun problem if you ask Robert, but um, <laughs> other, other than that situation, um, granted, you can, multiple people can work in the platform and they can, you know, you can work together that way. But I think Meredith raises an excellent point. Like, do you want that to be in Word or Google Docs? We are going to bring in chat we're also thinking about some cool, um, like, you know how when you need data from somebody on the team that's really only just needs to give you a couple numbers. So we're, we're thinking about ways where we can actually create a process where you come to the point where you need the data and you can actually send them a request, which they'll get by email. And they can either respond to the email or click on a link and they'll interact with Grantable and Grantable will ask them for the information. They'll put that in and then it'll go into the place where you need it. So that's great. Cause I know there's been times where I, I'll end up having to take out of Google doc, like just the section, make a whole nother page for them. So they won't go get sidetracked. They just answer this one paragraph. So yeah, that would solve a big problem. Yeah. So we're trying to do that. And then also those those data points usually show up again and again, and we lose sleep over their consistency. So we're working on all of that as well so that you can say this year's annual operating budget is this, the program budget is this, we helped this many people at, at this event, and yeah. those are consistent um, across your different work. So, so just so we can like round robin some of the really quick questions that have come in that are a little bit more feature focused, can you talk about the token system? People are confused by that. Yeah, so the tokens, um, thanks for your patience with that. That terminology is coming from the tokenization of words. So I talked about that earlier. The words, when they go into these models, actually get broken into their component parts. And the process is called tokenization. And so um, basically, when people are talking about interacting with these models in text, they're measuring the amount of text that's going in, and they're measuring it by tokens. And so that's sort of become the, the language um, put out by the model makers that we've, we're using. And then what we're trying to do is create that consistency through to the, the users on our platform as well. So they're not like crypto, they're not anything like that. It's sort of like fuel in your tank or your battery. It's yeah. like how much AI usage do you have left? The reason that we're not doing it straight to words is because eventually there will be really cool features that will still use uh, tokens or use credits. We could change it to something like credits, um, but that won't actually result in a, in a word or a, a written result per se. For example, like if you're uh, using a researcher to ask for census data, um, that will probably use a bunch of AI power, computing power, but you yeah. know, it might only generate, you know, a, a little result for you. And it, so it, we thought about going with words, but um, we're trying to communicate the concept of AI usage. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I like the battery analogy. That's a solid one. Uh, just for our unicorns that live abroad, do you, does Grantable work in other languages? Yes. Um, it's German the, specifically, you have German. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's getting better and better. Stay, 
OpenAI is putting out those updates pretty regularly. So most major global languages are, are pretty good now. Um, I'm not a German speaker, so any German speakers out there will have to judge for themselves. But some, as I hear, it's pretty cool. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, Mira, there you have it. Okay, so one of the things I think people are confused about is like you mentioned PDFs are a real beast. So like, how do you use PDFs and get that information into Grantable? Like, are you actually just having to go highlight all that text, but then like the formatting goes to heck? So what are you suggesting there? You can up. I would just say try it. Um, we we worked on this problem last week actually. So we've found what we think is a really good uh, translation method um, that uh, we actually we went out and like paid paid for this. So it's not an open source thing. It's it's supposedly one of the better things. Um, cool. You can use, I see a PDF to Word doc converter. I mean, essentially it's a very similar thing. We're just, we're going even more stripped down to something called Markdown. So we're really trying to pull away all of the formatting. Even Word has a lot of that too. Word files are way better than PDF files for getting to the text. Um, but yes, if all else fails, uh, you can you can copy and paste. Um, if you wanted that excerpt, you can paste it into this box here, um, oh. and then it will be part of your library. But give it a try. Just try uploading it and seeing what it looks like. Um, so you it would show up here, and then you could just click it open and see if it's all all mangled. But hopefully not. Cool. Well, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Is there something that you wish I'd asked that I didn't get us into? So something that I've been thinking a lot about is when the AI optimists that like, like Sam Altman and, and others talk about this future that, you know, is, is the preferred future, the AI future where it creates a ton of value, which is distributed and frees us up to do uh, to have better jobs and to have more time to spend as we like. Mm -hmm. It's funny that they always talk about freeing up time to care for one another, to pursue the arts, to take care of the environment. To They, they literally list basically the work of the nonprofit sector. And when I heard that, I that immediately caught my ear. And I think there's that's no accident. Um, if you think about the, the for-profit, the private sector, everybody there, is, their main mission is to make a profit. And this AI tool is going to come along and be able to do more and more human jobs or replace more and more labor. And those companies are all incentivized to do that because it'll lower their costs and increase their profit. So if, if people are shifting, if we want to get to this better version of the future, my evolving hypothesis is we're actually trying to get a lot of people to come into the nonprofit sector. And the very fact that it is nonprofit, that there isn't that motive to replace people with AI labor, and that we are focused on work that traditionally is not accounted for by the, the free market, by capitalism, um, I think that actually creates a kind of resilience to AI. It 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 doesn't want to eat <laughs> the the nonprofit work as much, I would say. Um, and so I actually think there's this really interesting intellectual space where I'm calling on the sector to say, hey, how what would it look like if the Nature Conservancy was the largest employer in the U.S. instead of Walmart? Like we have to kind of think forward in those types of ways and what would it take? Yeah, that's an abstract. Um, I, at first I was like, I don't know, this definitely is a fireside conference. I'm like, come on, now we need to actually be around a fire with some whiskey to have this debate. Yeah, right? let's, let's, um, but it's yeah. sometimes you know, I think there's also a benefit, like the lines are blurring between, you know, for-profit businesses that have a social enterprise mission, nonprofits that are utilizing tech more effectively than ever. Like it's getting really interestingly a lot more blurry. <laughs> I really think we're we're at this moment where I think the nonprofit sector, which has been mine for most of my career um, and has always just sort of been like junior varsity, you know, compared yeah. to the private sector. Sure. I, I don't think so. I think we've been innovating. I think we've been doing 
business on hard mode. <laughs> like not only do you have to do the service and provide the, the service, you actually have to run a whole other business to pay for it, which is like, you know, it's, it's running two businesses in one. And I think we've been doing that because we're mission motivated, because we see this work that isn't going to pay, but needs to get done. So how do we motivate ourselves? How do we organize? How do we find money and resources? How do we use tech? So I think the sector could have um, a moment, um, a really, really important one in the context of AI, in that if you think about the, all the ideal scenarios where people are doing these human and planet-centered works, the groups that are already doing that work would be the ideal place to absorb these people and to bring them into and, and expand the sector. Um, so I think, I don't know how to get there. I'm Grantable is my little way of trying to help that go forward. Um, but I think that's one way where I hope the nonprofit sector will come into this particular tech revolution with maybe more confidence than we would have in the past. That is that this technology, artificial intelligence, requires human-centered alignment more than any other technology ever. It's not even close. And the, the sector that is innovated the most on human-centered thinking and alignment and values and systems and organizing, planet-centered as well, uh, is the nonprofit center. So the intellectual property necessary to make AI successful for the world, I think lives in the nonprofit sector. And your only proof that you need is that OpenAI started as a nonprofit for a reason. They saw the problematic potential of having this be totally profit motivated. And right. there's a battle right now between you know the nonprofit uh, people that want it to be values driven and then the people that are pulling it towards um, just making more money. Um, so I think we have this really unprecedented role to play in this technical revolution. 100%. No, we're tracking with you on that. And this is going to be, I think you just published some content on this. So everybody I want to recommend, go find Philip on LinkedIn, get onto his podcast, his private podcast. It's amazing. This is like, he's my go-to for be tracking what's happening in the industry. All right. I'm going to try to sneak in one more question and then we need to wrap up. I was supposed to remind you, ask me about research capacity versus chat GPT. I don't know exactly what we were talking about. Does that jog your memory? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so we, we touched on this and thanks for the reminder. So a lot of people use chat GPT for research and then say, Oh, it's a terrible researcher. <laughs> so it is uh, for the reason that we talked about earlier about the results are just probabilistic. There's no, it does not understand the meaning. It does not understand the veracity or the accuracy of its products. Just that it has put every next token out based on a formula. So when, when people ask it a research question, it will respond like a researcher. If you say, it, answer me in the in the style of a PhD dissertation, it will sound authoritatively wrong. And right. so when I say right now, please avoid using ChatGPT as a research tool. The reason is if it's very general knowledge, it'll probably get it right, but you really don't know. There's no clear line when you're crossing over into statistics or data that is just totally factually fiction. Um, so just because it seems like it's giving you a quick answer, it's such an illusion. And I understand why people are, because some things are right, but you don't know what's wrong. Um, the caveat is that they are working on combining large language models with search databases. So you'll see Google and Bing going full speed at trying to win yeah, this. Yeah, where you can interact with a search engine as you would. A, right. a They're going to go pull census data and integrate it and all of that, right? Yeah, yeah. but I think it's still, there's so there's so many hard problems there in trying to distill down the right information from huge data sets like the size of the internet and figuring out what is what is right, especially when right is maybe a little more subjective. So I would just really caution people to... Um, try to follow your, your traditional research practices. Once you have the data, once you have the numbers and the statistics, 
put those into chat GBT or Grantable and it will keep those and help you work with them in, in different ways. Yeah. I just love this. I think this really buttons up like what's so important about like that distinction potentially between chat GPT and grantable is like, as you're building this knowledge, as especially you're doing the research, like it is housed in one place that will continue to serve you. And one of the things when I'm in a private mastermind and we were talking about how, you know, there's an upfront investment period, like you need to put in a couple hours of giving it good information to have like your outputs are your inputs. And so I think what we can all take away from this is like, you're on the front end of this. You're not getting left behind. Have curiosity, go tinker, experiment, like go back to your childlike state where you're literally just building like a mud hut in the backyard and you're having like, you're having play and you're not, we're not being so staunchy about it. So then that, and if we can bring that energy and approach to this, I think we're all going to have a lot more fun with it. And um, so, yeah, I think you've really set us up, Philip, for like knowing where to go tinker and experiment more, give you feedback, you're building out your product and, um, and just kind of relax on this whole thing. So we don't, we don't freak out. Like it's got a long ways to go, even though it's come a long way. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to try to improve upon what you just said. So, <laughs> oh. well, it's because you did all the heavy lifting. So thank you for that. Cool. Okay. Everybody will show Philip some love in the chat. Super appreciate that you've been doing that. Thank you so very much. And with that, you know where to go find Philip to keep following him. And we will send out the replay in addition to the very generous 100,000 tokens that Grantable has given us to give to you. So we'll share information on that in tomorrow's email. I think that's a wrap, folks. <laughs> Bye, people.